Welcome back to The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Now we head straight to our second conversation where we'll uh, you know, look at some of the issues that the president uh, who has continued to speak about. I mean, yesterday in that exclusive interview on a sister station, the president continually uh, spoke about the issue of uh, making some achievement in the areas of security, economy, and the fight against corruption. We do have a guest joining us this morning via Zoom. He's a public affairs analyst, Nika Goulet. It's good to have you join us. Good morning. Thank you very much. And Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. It's good to have you join us. Thank, uh, you. thank you for your time. All right, so let's get to the crux of, uh, you know, the issue now. I, I'm sure that you probably would have actually followed through with the conversation with the president where he talked about, you know, making some kind of progress in terms of security in the northeastern part of Nigeria. And he also talked about the economy, the improvement on, uh, you know, production, I mean, talking about crude production and the fight against corruption, among other issues. We'd like to share your thoughts, you know, generally on the president's uh, statement and speech and that interview. Thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I want to wish our president a happy new year. And I want to wish him good health and grace as he sees through the last months of his administration. I also want to thank the president for making our time to have that interview so that Nigerians can hear from him once more. Uh, we have had a president who has not been in the public eye for a long time. So for him to have granted two press interviews, exclusive press interviews, one last year and this year is, is a good thing. Uh, my general view of the president's interview is that uh, to be honest, it's disappointing because um, with six and a half years into his administration of eight years, you expect the president to be giving us what he has delivered in concrete terms and not really out to us the challenges that uh, we have in Nigeria. The president is not an analyst like myself. The president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. So he has got everything at his disposal to tackle Nigeria's problems. So we would like to see the president talking about how he is tackling the issues that are confronting Nigeria and not just describing the issues and talking about what needs to be in place or is not in place. So on that uh, basis, I would say that the president's overall performance in the interview fell below the mark for me. Um, uh, now let's you know look at uh, let's pick out some of the things that he spoke on you know and one of them of course that has become popular is um, state police uh, the president you know when asked about uh, the relevance of state police and how you know he felt about it he you know he instead you know spoke about traditional rulers and um, local leaders you know and how you know they need to step up and how important they are with regards in security and dealing with security challenges in the country. Um, Mr. Gole, do you, do you agree, you know, with that narrative, um, or would you say that the president maybe just didn't have the right response, you know, with regard to state police, or just doesn't believe in the idea of state policing? Okay, so I have two answers to this question. The first one is that yes, I agree with the president that the issues of insecurity require multi-sectoral approach. So bringing in the traditional institution is right. The president was correct in that instance because the traditional institution is also very important in tackling insecurity. Because uh, these people who cause all sorts of insecurities in our communities don't fall from the sky. They live within the communities, within those localities. They either perpetrate this insecurity within the communities they are living in or they travel from the communities where they are to another community and perpetrate these atrocities. So they, they are known, you know, uh, they, they, they are not, they are not, um, they, they are not a ghost. They don't fall from the sky. They are living within the communities amongst the people of which the traditional institution is superintending. So bringing the traditional institutions into the picture is very correct. But the second answer I have to give to this is that the president's response 
first shot of what you expect him to say. Because, yes, the traditional institution is there, but it shouldn't be the only approach that we are going to give to local policing. The president needs to cast his eyes to all the developed economies around the world. I mean, at a point, Nigeria, we had vision 2020. We have vision 2020, 2020, which was to say by the year 2020, that is two years ago, we should have joined the 20 top developed countries in the world. So there's no way we want to join the top 20 developed countries in the world without having to do what those developed countries are doing. That's just the only way. We have to do what they are doing, otherwise we can't join their league. And in all the top 20 developed countries in the world, policing is pretty much uh, um, our local, pretty much local. You, you don't have national police as we have in Nigeria. In fact, policing in some of those developed economies is on city basis, city basis. So you have Ikeja police, different from Ikorodu police, different from Victoria Island police. We're not even talking local government. But in Nigeria, we cannot say, let us just devolve down to city police. But at least let us bring policing down to the state level. When we bring policing down to the state level, two things are going to happen immediately. Number one, we're going to have a lot many more police forces in Nigeria. In the United Kingdom here where I'm sitting, there are 42 police forces in this country. So in Nigeria, if we bring policing to the state level, there will be 36 police forces all over the country. They are going to recruit more personnel because the states will start putting more money into policing. You know? And the, 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 the excuse that people are given is that, oh, if we give policing to the governors, the governors are going to abuse it. This is scaremongering. Yeah, well, but the, the president also expressed, you know, concern in that direction. I mean, he, he likened the relationship. He was uh, making reference to the relationship between, you know, state government and the local government, saying that uh, what has actually uh, happened all through the years, we understand that there seemed to be a lot of domination by, uh, you know, uh, by the other party over the other one. And so um, he is also of the opinion that um, that relationship is not very cordial. It has not yielded any result. And therefore, uh, the issue of state policing is not really a solution to the security concerns that we're faced with. Thank you very much for that uh, perspective. I have two answers to that uh, uh, perspective you have raised. The first one is that if the president recognizes and in his words, he said that the governors are carrying out unconstitutional acts against the local government. The president swore on oath to defend the constitution of Nigeria. So if he sees some 36 boys around the country contravening the constitution of Nigeria, it behoves of on him as the commander in chief of Nigeria and the chief law officer of Nigeria to come upon those who are actually contravening the constitution, whoever they are. It doesn't matter if they are governors. So that is one side of it. The second side of it is that when we bring that to the policing that we're discussing, that a state governor has got a police force does not mean the state governor can abuse the police force and perpetrate illegalities. Because once he does that, we are now in the realm of criminality. And the president of Nigeria is there to defend the constitution. And he has to take action about that. I'm talking about 42 police forces here in the UK. If one of the county police chiefs decide that he was going to do an illegal thing, the, uh, the, the, the laws of the UK are going to take effect against him. You know, oh. that you are a police chief or you are a governor does not mean you are above the law. So if we have a president who has devolved policing to become local, and he's sitting now and watching and seeing who is doing the right thing and who is doing the wrong thing, and he's going after those who are doing the wrong things, then nothing is, is going to go wrong. Let me tell you one thing. I am today speaking on a private television station. I was a student, I think a university student as at that time, when the debate on whether the media should be privatized in Nigeria was ongoing. A lot of people were scaremongering all over the place and saying, oh, if you have private TV station, 
private radio stations, people will be executing coup every day. They'll be executing coup. It will cost insecurity and all of that. Since we have been having private media, TV, television, newspapers, how many coups have been executed using the private media? Well, so these are some of the really... scare monsters that are going on. Well, like you've mentioned, it's, you know, very likely fear-mongering, you know, and of course the conversation this morning is trying to understand what the president's mindset is with regard to some of these things, you know, whether, um, you know, governors will take advantage of it or not, you know, the, the point is that the federal structure that we have with regards to police is not working. Um, will state, you know, police be more effective? Does the president believe that state police will be more effective? Does the president understand that the federal structure with regards to police is not working? But, you know, some of all of that. Um, you know, and of course, the argument that you know the traditional rulers know everybody in the community doesn't stop them from being criminals. A criminal is a criminal, whether he knows traditional ruler, whether he's a, a son or a cousin to the Igwe of the community, he's still a criminal. Um, and we have the police structure that should arrest those criminals or not. I'm sure that you know we've spoken about we've spoken about this thing with, with um, security experts. You know, even in northern Nigeria, they will tell you that they know these people. Nobody has ever accused them of being strange faces. They know who they are. But they are still criminals. They are still committing crimes, still terrorizing society. I want you to finally speak um, with regards to uh, the president's um, um, response to uh, the indicators. You know, he was questioned with regards to the indicators on the economy, on job creation, on poverty and the likes. Um, and his response really was that everybody needs to go back to the farm. It seems President Muhammad Bori has some attachment, some personal love for agriculture and farming. You know, and so his response at every time when he is told that he, the indicators that are put out by his own agencies of government, not anybody else, his own agencies of government, um, he first of all questions those figures and then says that, well, he thinks everybody needs to go back to farm. Um, Mr. Angule, what do you think? Yes, before I answer your question on the economy, I want to agree with you in the last point that you made. We have a federal police now. There is a single inspector general of police that superintends over the entire police forces across the country. If that inspector general is not effective, that means the entire Nigerian police force is ineffective. If we have 36 state police forces, imagine that 50 of them are effective, 50 are not effective. It will mean that 18 in 18 states we are going to have strong police policing. You know, so generally as a country, that would be better for us than putting all our eggs in one basket. So now to go to the, the question of the economy. You see, the, the president, uh, first and foremost, answered a question of the economy by saying uh, the, the crude oil was 2.1 million barrels before he came in at $100 and all of that. And for me, this is very disappointing because the president seems not to see the real issues with the Nigerian economy. Because if you talk about that crude, let us start with that crude. Even though uh, we are producing crude now in the 1 million plus barrels, the president fails to understand that immediately we sell that crude and end the dollars, we turn the entire dollars to the, to the downstream market to buy petroleum products and import them into the country. So the president needed to have arrested that within the first year in office by ensuring that our refineries are up and running. Once our refineries were up and running, that means when we say crude, that means we'll bring the dollars back to Nigeria. We don't use the dollars now to buy petroleum products. That's number one. Number two, the president for six and a half years have seen our gas being fled. And then we are going to as far as the United States to go and buy gas. He hasn't done anything about that. The president came in when power supply was three gigawatts to the economy. He's about to leave three gigawatts to this economy. In the United Kingdom, where I'm speaking to you now, the power supply every day to the UK economy of 65 million people is 730 gigawatts. And Nigeria, an economy of 200 million people, the economy is being supplied with three gigawatts, three, one, two, three, not even 30. How can the president expect that economy to do well? Globally, by global standards, you are expected to supply one gigawatt to one million people. So as Nigerians are 200 million people, we should be supplying Nigeria's economy with 200, 200 gigawatts. gigawatts. We're giving right, it Mr. Goulet. So if a, yes. Oh, I, just quickly wrap up, you know, because we need to end uh, the conversation so, here. So, so if, if the up. president, 
has a tractor, if the president has a tractor that needs 200 liters per day to perform optimally, and he's dropping three liters in that tractor, how does he expect that tractor to work? And the president identifies a low-hanging fruit in Nigeria, which is agriculture. In his own words, he said that experts have told him that only two and a half percent of Nigeria's arable land is being cultivated. And yet, in six and a half years, he has not grown that percentage to about 20, 30, 40 percent. Because if he did that, then unemployment will go, food insecurity will go, importation of food will go, and job creation will be there. So this is the concrete actions that you expect the president to be taking. But unfortunately, it is six and a half years down the road. Now we have oh. one and a half years. We hope the president will now take concrete actions to execute this image. So agriculture is something that can turn around within a year. You plant rice, you harvest it within a year. It doesn't even take long to do that. All right, Mr. Agule, uh, sadly, we have to wrap up here. Um, but of course, thanks as always for joining us and for sharing your views with us um, on very numerous issues. Uh, we wish you a good day ahead. Thank you very much. And have a nice day. Absolutely. Uh, of course, uh, we're going to be back after this very short break, uh, still talking on President Muhammadu Buhari, but this time not on his interview yesterday, but on his new appointments. Yesterday we spoke about Doin Salami, who has been appointed on the President's Economic Advisory Team, and a couple of other appointments that have been made. We'll get back uh, right after the short break.